I'm not my, much on psycho babble and buzzwords and letting your inner puppy come out and pee or whatever. <laughs> Dr. Phil went from a regular on the Oprah Winfrey show to the star of his own show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Hey, look at me. Let's look see at your me. talent. No, huh? hey, hey, hey. No, you need to look at me. I don't have to do Okay, take okay. him out. Before raking in a whopping $79 million in 2017 alone, gaining 1.6 million subscribers on his YouTube channel and launching the career of Danielle Brigoli. I made you just like how Oprah made you. You were nothing before I came on this show. Thank you for that. Before being parodied on shows like Tosh.0, South Park and Mad TV. Well, Now let me tell you something real straight, alright? Okay, nobody is perfect. Mm -hmm. But you'd be real close if you gassed up those fun balloons just a couple of sizes bigger. Right? Before multiple guests of the Dr. Phil show accused him of providing them with drugs and alcohol to heighten the on air drama. In my opinion, um, you're killing yourself, man. I am. Yeah. You're killing I am. yourself. I know I am. Dr. Phil grew up dealing with crippling poverty and an alcoholic father. While he worked two paper routes at the age of 12 to help put food on the table, he was also a bit of a badass. Phil. At 13 and 14 years old, he and his friends would often go on late night joyrides. He'd find a more productive outlet for his aggression playing football and manage to get into university on an athletic scholarship before switching his focus to psychology. But before finding fame and fortune as the host on the Dr. Phil show, he would go through several unsatisfying careers, a dangerous brush with partial blindness and a failed marriage. Hey guys, what is going on? I am Rebecca Felgate documenting the changing days of Dr. Phil's life prior to fame right here on Before They Were Famous. Famous. Also guys, please do use the hashtag GetWellFactGod. He loves it. He actually really, really, really loves it. Some of you guys may not even know this, but Michael actually even appeared on the Dr. Phil show way back in the day. You should check out the video he recently put up of him reacting to his appearance. It is absolutely golden. I think it's safe to say that Michael and Dr. Phil are like this. Also, as always, do let us know who you want us to document next in the comment section down below. Michael, I mean, oh my god, he really has seen it all. He's been everywhere. We think we'll tell ourselves the truth because it's us, right? That's not true. You, you, you feed yourself so much bad thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin McGraw was born to Geraldine Jerry McGraw and Joseph J. McGraw Jr. in Venita, Oklahoma on September 1st, 1950. He grew up with three sisters, Dina, Donna and Brenda in North Texas and Denver, Colorado. This was where his father was an equipment supplier to folks in the petroleum business. Or that is, black gold, Texas tea. Dad was selling drill bits, he was also an alcoholic. In a rare interview, Dr. Phil explained, My mother was and is so loving, but she had to work all the time. I had an alcoholic father, basically a binge drinker. I had sisters who married in high school to escape, and I just had absolutely no leadership whatsoever. A lot of what I ultimately defined myself to be was a reaction against that. My dad was beaten and abused by his mother all through his childhood. She was a mean, vicious woman. I knew what he grew up with and why he was so embittered, but it doesn't make it any easier to live with. While his father was never abusive to Phil and his sisters, the alcohol did have consequences. His sales job evaporated, leading him to decide to go back to school and get a PhD in psychology. So I guess Phil was a bit of a chip off the old block in some ways. The family would relocate to Oklahoma City as Phil's father pursued his new career. While enrolled at the University of Oklahoma, he wasn't drinking anymore but he also wasn't making any money. As Dr. Phil explained, we traded alcoholism for being dirt poor. At this point, Phil and his family were living with his older sister, who was married and had her own house. Everyone in the family did what they could to contribute to the household income. Phil had two paper routes and the money went towards the family's groceries. 
After his dad completed his PhD, he got an internship in Kansas City. While he couldn't afford to take the whole family with him, he felt that Phil needed to be with his dad, so the two moved into a small apartment together. This was fine at first, but eventually his dad did start drinking again. He had every Wednesday afternoon off, Phil said, and every Thursday morning I would have to go find the car. He'd go off and get drunk and he'd leave the car and come home in a cab. I'd have to get receipts out of his pocket and go downtown and find the car. I'm only 15, I don't even have a driver's license, but I'm down there finding the car and driving through rush hour to get home. While all of Phil's sisters dealt with their father's alcoholism by getting married during high school, Phil decided to deal with it in other ways. He was an angry kid and not always well behaved. As a teenager, his friends would steal the family car and he would go on nighttime joyrides with them. Now this really makes you think, if he was driving around in stolen cars, why did he give the Cash Me Outside girl so much shit about it? What do you say to yourself that gives you the right to take somebody else's car? You just take it and you don't consider that it belongs to someone else. No. Fortunately, Phil had other more productive ways of dealing with his rage issues. Throughout his youth, he let off a lot of steam on the football field and eventually became quite good at the sport. He was a star player at Shawnee Mission North High School in Overland Park, Kansas. And as such, he was dating the head cheerleader and the homecoming queen. It's an American classic. She was called Debbie Higgins McCall. Now, by the end of his school career, Phil had shot up to six foot four and he was awarded a football scholarship to play middle linebacker at the University of Tulsa. This was before transferring to Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, where his dad had also once played football. One time while Phil was playing football, he got hit in the eye, which unfortunately left him partially blind. He apparently then decided to study optic nerve damage to learn how to correct the issue, and he spent hours wearing an eye patch over his good eye to strengthen the damaged one. During this time, Debbie was living in Springfield, but the two continued their relationship at long distance. After two years apart, they reunited in Roland Park and got married in her childhood church in 1970. Now, both were just 20 years old at the time. They then moved to Topega, where Phil built and owned a health spa. Obviously, unfortunately, that marriage didn't quite work out, and they would annul the marriage in 1973. According to Dr. Phil, it was a pretty amicable breakup. We never had a cross word, he said. We just sat down and said, why did we do this? But according to Phil's ex-wife, it wasn't all so pleasant. Debbie said after they got married, the relationship started to change. She claims he was no longer the kind, sensitive boyfriend he'd been in high school. He said that she did not let her get involved in the family business and instead demanded that she stay at home, focusing on looking nice and lifting weights to bulk her chest. The only thing you need to concern yourself with is how you look to a real man, all right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> She also claims that friends and neighbours questioned his commitment to the marriage, and after she confronted him about his infidelity, he actually didn't deny it. It was while in the process of annulling the marriage in 1973 that Dr. Phil began dating Robin Jo Jameson. He would then go on to marry her in 1976, and the pair have been together ever since. Together, the two have two children, Jay born in 1979 and Jordan born in 1986. In 1975, Phil graduated with a BA in psychology from MSU. He then went on to earn a master's in experimental psychology the following year. He then went on to earn a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of North Texas. He then joined his dad's psychology practice in Wichita Falls, Texas. There was just one problem. He absolutely hated being a therapist. He said, I didn't have the patience for it. People would want to sit there and talk to you for six months and a lot of times I could figure in the first hour that they just wanted to rent a friend. I'd be sitting there saying, you know, here's your problem, you're a jerk. Phil, he's such a savage. Another issue that would come up with Phil's practice was a complaint filed against him with the Texas State Board of Examiners of Psychologists. The board would go on to determine in 1988 that Phil had failed to provide proper separation between the termination of therapy and the initiation of employment. Now, this was when he hired a patient for a part time job. There were also claims that Phil had inappropriately touched a patient, but the board's investigation included no reference to that. There's an expression where I come from. 
The cow with the biggest udders has the most farmers pulling on her teats. In 1983, Phil, his father, and a successful Texas businesswoman, Thelma Box, teamed up for a new venture called Pathways. Basically, they would deliver seminars to the public aimed at helping people to create and achieve their goals. Pathways did pretty well, but after eight years, Phil sold his stock in the company and moved to a new job. In 1990, he joined a lawyer named Gary Dobbs in founding a trial consulting firm called Courtroom Sciences Incorporated. Eventually, the company would become quite successful, advising Fortune 500 companies. It was through this enterprise that he would eventually come to meet Oprah Winfrey. How y'all doing? Yeah! It's so cool. I feel like I raised this dude. It started because we were going through, I was going through a hard time. In 1996, Oprah and one of her guests, Howard Lyman, were involved in a lawsuit called the Amarillo, Texas Beef Trial. In the midst of the mad cow disease epidemic, Oprah and her guests made disparaging comments about beef. After the episode aired, cattle futures dropped 10% from 62 to 55 cents per pound. Feedlot operator Paul Engler and the company Cactus Feeders decided to sue Oprah for $12 million. To prepare for the trial, Oprah hired Dr. Phil. After she won the case in 1998, she was so impressed with Phil that she decided to invite him onto her show. I wanted you to come on t television and do for the other people what you had done for me. She liked him and she decided actually she would invite him back many, many, many times. Good or bad, up or down, I'm not just your husband in the bedroom, I'm in your husband, I'm your husband all day long. Because you're probably not going to come out okay. Really? Yeah, because they're probably going to reconcile at least temporarily enough to get rid of your meddling ass. Because <laughs> I believe in me and I'm betting on me, not them. Dr. Phil's appearances proved so successful that in April of 1998, he began appearing on the show every week. We decided that he would come on the shows on Tuesdays, and I love Tuesdays. Remember I used to say, I'm so glad you're here, I can leave my brain at home. <laughs> it was fantastic. Over the next four years, he published four best-selling books. Oprah's production company Harpo Studios soon put together a daily TV show for Dr. Phil. Now this aired for the first time in September of 2002. I want to give you a wake-up call that says do not do that anymore. The show has gone on to be syndicated throughout the United States and internationally. It has also been nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award every year since 2004. As for the rest of this story, well, you know the story because this is before they were famous. For more information on Dr. Phil, request an after they were famous video. Remember you guys can always let us know who's next on Twitter or Instagram at McCruddenM. You guys can also find me on my own Instagram at MissRebeccaJ. I also have my own YouTube channel, Rebecca Fergit Official, which is a great place if you guys like Harry Potter. But if you don't, then maybe just stick to the Instagram. Thank you guys for having me today, and I for one really hope the fact god gets better soon. Bye! If you think I exploit people, every time you bring a guest on this show, you exploit them and spread whatever problems they have to the whole world. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. You can go. And then they pull me into my dressing room, and there was two liters of vodka. I drank the entire bottle. Next thing you know, I'm being carried onto the stage because I can barely walk. 